Hills and Valleys is a podcast that uncovers stories from leaders in healthcare, tech, and everything in between. Straight from the heart of Silicon Valley, we give you a look at the good, the bad, and the future, one episode at a time. Brought to you by Petro Medical. Hey everyone, Omar M. Khatib, Director of Growth at Petro Medical. I have another great episode of Hills and Valleys. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen the exciting news going around that Google's DeepMind, uh, and that's the artificial intelligence company that Google owns, has recently published a study on acute kidney injury and how they're trying to predict it as well. Now, that should tell you something about how big of a problem acute kidney injury is if Google's actually getting into it as well. Now, uh, reading from a paper that was published recently in Nature by Dr. Uh, Eric Topol, you know, this will really give you a perspective on acute kidney injury. Now, acute kidney injury occurs in about one in five patients in U.S. hospitals. That's one in five patients that go into a hospital. It's a very common condition in the hospital because it can be caused by a number of different factors, such as abnormal blood pressure or blood volume. And the ability to predict whether or when acute kidney injury will happen is very limited. For people who are at high risk of developing this condition, the standard clinical approach is daily assessment of their laboratory test results, which includes things like concentration of of, uh, creatinine in their blood, because high levels of this molecule is a hallmark of kidney problems. But all the technology and the labs we have today tell us after the fact. So naturally, we want to catch up with thought leaders who have a passion for this big uh, uh, disease and illness. And so we were able to catch up with Dr. Slava Barotka uh, at the Society for Cardiac Anesthesiologists where he was leading the workshops in acute kidney injury. Now, let me give you a little background on him before we jump into the episode. Dr. Barotka is a professor of anesthesiology and critical care medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His area of clinical expertise is cardiac anesthesiology. And he's also known as an expert in both red blood cell deformability and vascular cyst stiffness. Now, as you'll see from the episode, he has a strong connection and a very fascinating one to biomedical engineering and is always developing new tools for real-time assessment of renal function. And he's also optimized various strategies to help reduce renal failure post-cardiac surgery. So, of course, we had to catch up with him. You're gonna love this episode. You'll even love it. You'll love his story even more. So without further ado, here's the episode with Dr. Slava Brodka. Hi everyone, this is Omar M. Khatib, Director of Growth over at Petro Medical, and we are at the Society of uh, Cardiac Anesthesiology here in Chicago, and we've got a chance to catch up with Dr. Barotka, a uh, very busy guy, and fortunately we were able to grab him for a little bit today, so thank you so much for sitting down and joining us. You're welcome. Wonderful. Now, Dr. Barotka, uh, you know, I have to ask, you know, what, what's your story? How, how did you get into medicine, and how did you get to the position that you're in today? Uh, so I was born in Eastern Europe, in, in Belarus. And there was a, a, a time where the Soviet Union collapse was happening, and I was a classmate of uh, one very famous guy in Belarus. His name is Victor Kisley. He's a founder of uh, Wargaming's Net. You know, very big, uh, uh, you know, and prominent guy. Anyway, so he asked me to join him and go into the computer science. And uh, uh, my parents told me, how about you choose something more uh, realistic uh, and go to medicine, right? So basically, you know, that, that's how I ended up in, in, in medicine. And then uh, uh, when I finished, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to move to the United States for training. Uh, and I came to New York, did my uh, uh, surgical internship there. Then I, what I call, I downgraded to the south, to Philadelphia, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson uh, University. This is where I did my uh, anesthesia training. And we had a, 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 a Jefferson, a Gibbon building. And you know, it, it's a history, so who is a Gibbon? So he's the first guy who in the world developed first cardiopulmonary bypass, right, for cardiac surgery. So that's how, you know, my life with cardiac surgery uh, uh, started. And then uh, I moved to, again, downgrade to the south, to the Baltimore for my fellowship in cardiac anesthesia. And I stayed there as a faculty. Uh, and now I'm associate professor. And, and you're at you have a, a lab up at Hopkins, I, I understand. And uh, uh, yeah, we, 
you know, we, we have a great interest in uh, clinical outcomes and uh, one of my particular interests is uh, acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery. Very interesting, you know, and uh, again, I, I'm, I'm with a company who's uh, very passionate and mission driven around the kidney and me myself, you know, having spending time in, in medical education, the kidney is a very complicated organ very, very complicated, and kid the kidney injury is a, sort of a black box of a, of a syndrome of all the things. Why, why did that, why is that an, of interest for you? What attracted you to that? Uh, uh, so, so basically, uh, it's not that uh, black box. Uh, I I if you open physiology textbook, uh, you know, th th they will list uh, how much oxygen the, the each organ requires. And, uh, you know, everybody thinking about the brain, you know, you cut the oxygen and it dies and, you know, and store it. However, if you normalize it by uh, weight, so per, let's say, 100 gram of tissue, uh, the brain needs only 3 milliliters of oxygen per minute versus kidney require five milliliters, right? It's See, physiology textbook, right? <laughs> so that's how important oxygen delivery is for the kidney. Yeah. Interesting. You know, and, um, you know, with AKI, it seems that it's one of those dis uh, syndromes and diseases that if you incur an injury with your kidney, it causes a lot of other issues in the body, correct? Well, um, so, AKI is a, is a specific uh, term for acute kidney injury and you know in the general public people usually develop chronic renal insufficiency which develop you know hypertension diabetes over the years however AKI is much bigger issue in hospital settings and uh, uh, with uh, the really high prevalence in people with sepsis, in people who end up in ICU, and there is very specific subgroup, second largest subgroup of all AKI, it's cardiac surgery related. It, it is called cardiac surgery associated acute kidney injury. And uh, uh, it has been known for years. Uh, and clearly patients come in for cardiac surgery, they, they have their heart problems, they want it to get fixed, and nobody's coming thinking, I fix my heart, but I end up on dialysis, right? So that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And so how do you fix, fix a problem like that? Where does it start? Well, so where it starts is, is again prevention and also knowing what are the causes of acute kidney injury, specifically in cardiac surgery where patient might come with normal renal function. Uh, so there is a, this is multifactorial as many other problems, but specifically our interest at Hopkins and our focus was uh, related to cardiopulmonary bypass because cardiopulmonary bypass, this is what set cardiac surgery apart from any other surgery. And again, if we look all surgeries, the highest risk of RKI is after the cardiac surgery, right? So why, is why is that? Why is it after cardiac surgery specifically? So a, a, again, uh, we think it's related to cardiopulmonary bypass because all your normal physiology and blood flow are disrupted. You know, you go on this machine, you know, you lose your pulsatile flow, there is a hemodilution because, you know, bypass machine decreases your hemoglobin count, you have to be on pressors, then you have to come off and there is reperfusion injury. It's very, very complex, you know, it's sophisticated machine, made cardiac surgery pretty safe today, but still with inherent risk. Interesting. Now, you mentioned something earlier that uh, that I wanted, to, if you could dig a little deeper into it. You mentioned the disruption of pulsatile flow. Can you, for the listeners who, we have some medical students and <laughs> residents, can you explain the pulsatile flow to the kidney? Why is that important? How is that s is it disrupted in cardiac surgery? So, kidney specifically uh, needs flow, not just blood pressure, but the flow. And when we think about the flow in uh, medical literature, everybody tells you know, your normal cardiac output is five liters a minute. 
And when uh, you know lay person think about five liters a minute as if you know it's it's going out of your hose, right? In reality, uh, the heart doesn't work like that, right? It's pulsatile, it's intermittent. You have a contraction of the heart, it sends a stroke volume, and then you multiply by heart rate. That's your cardiac output, right? And uh, uh, this is very complex process. So when, when the stroke volume hits the central vasculature and kidneys connect right to the central vasculature through the abdominal aorta, uh, there is you know compliance, resistance, there is what is called Winken cell model uh, where uh, the central uh, arteries and aorta store their energy with a uh, heart contraction and then during diastole when the heart is not pumping blood into the arterial system that energy and blood going backwards uh, and that's why in people uh, who smoke who have uh, stiff arteries who, who has uh, arteriosclerosis they have a really high incidence of chronic kidney injury because y you lose all of this mechanism mm. uh, so kidney you know require flow and the, and they you know see this pulsatility uh, so when you go on bypass uh, the major issues related to kidney injury is not just the fact that you lose pulsatility as long as you maintain adequate flow the problem is we don't have any monitors none which can uh, detect how much of cardiac output was the proportion of cardiac output going to the kidney and we know in a normal healthy person it basically like 25 percent mm -hmm. right so you go on on bypass you lose this pulsatility it's continuous flow we have no clue how much out of this flow which is same five liters what the patient had before will actually go to the kidney mm. or to the brain right? Interesting. so that's you know part of the challenges that there are no technologies which can assess continuously in real time renal perfusion or perfusion of the kidneys they just non-existent and I guess this problem becomes even more complicated because you're administrating different drugs in the, in the surgery you're also doing hemodialysis and so uh, the the amount of fluid that is being fluctuated through the vasculature is going to change and so these all these factors they they yeah, we, make it more difficult correct yeah dialysis for patients who develop renal failure so we don't do dialysis to begin with uh, and hope to avoid it <laughs> Uh, but going back to cardiopulmonary bypass, you know, part of our research is to focus on adequate oxygen delivery on cardiopulmonary bypass. And there is a group in Italy who just finished randomized control trial on the topic, uh, you know, multi-center where they uh, uh, in real time calculated oxygen delivery on bypass which depends on the flow and also on hemoglobin concentration and kept it at set on threshold and if you do this kind of goal directed uh, then there was a reduction in acute kidney injury we did basically the same study at hopkins five years ago retrospective also developing specific protocol with focus on oxygen delivery so if you pay attention to this very simple uh, physiological parameter uh, we had a reduction of AKI basically three times but not all AKI are equal you know uh, now the current standard for assessing kidney injury is uh, is called KDGO criteria mm -hmm. which basically stage AKI as a, a AKI stage one two three uh, uh, and uh, AKI-1 is a mild one. Patients would go through the surgery, they wouldn't even know that their kidney were affected. They wouldn't be on dialysis, they will go home and do everything else uh, normal. It's almost same problem as hypertension. If you don't you know, measure it, people don't even know that they have a high mm. blood pressure. And down the road, it has very negative consequences. So here is with uh, the same story with cardiac surgery and mild AKIs. You know, we measure creatinine, we know it happened. We know that it has negative consequences down the line in patient's life. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but they shouldn't don't know. And they how many of them follow up with a nephrologist after that either? I don't think there's much of a discussion even. Right. right? So the currently, if you look at the literature over the last, you know, 40 years, the problem of cardiac surgery associated acute kidney injury is still exists. And the rates mm. of AKI uh, was in the literature from 20 to 40 percent, mm -hmm. depending on different definition, didn't change in the last 40 years, despite multiple different uh, uh, medication intervention tried. Uh, so, so far everything is failing. And uh, uh, now I think I see the uh, light at the end of the tunnel, uh, and that's what we speak at our society, uh, with uh, uh, new interventions, specific on cardiac surgery, like this oxygen deliver, like uh, not using um, very aggressive ultrafiltration and removing extra fluid from patient, which deprives the kidney of, uh, 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 of fluids. And uh, uh, universally, the society is moving towards using balanced crystalloids IV fluids which were used during the surgery and uh, exclusively now we're in a plasma light which was not the case to even two to three years ago and it looks like a small things but all together you put them in a bundle bundle intervention and that's how you decrease the rates of AKI. Interesting. Now you had a, a workshop here at the SCA specifically on fluid management, but also, I believe, in prevention of AKI. Can, can you share some of the pearls from that for those who, unfortunately, weren't able to attend the meeting? Yeah, so uh, uh, basically we're talking about the uh, goal-directed uh, perfusion. And there is uh, several items which I already uh, elucidated about, you know, uh, paying attention to hemoglobin and flow and calculating uh, um, oxygen delivery that the threshold for this is between 280 and 300 milliliters of oxygen per minute per meter square so you have to calculate uh, from height and weight body surface area you have to to talk as a teamwork with a perfusionist to set the goal uh, within the last year there was randomized control trials uh, uh, done on transfusion and cardiac surgery, which basically showed that um, restrictive transfusion strategy, having the hemoglobin threshold of seven gram per deciliter is safe and same outcomes as a liberal transfusion, and if anything is actually decrease uh, your complications. So now we live in this arena on bypass where you have hemodilution, you have low hemoglobin, you cannot transfuse because if anything it leads harm, which basically leave you the only option to prevent AKI by increasing the flow on bypass. Interesting. Interesting. Now, uh, one question I had, because that's, you know, in educating myself about AKI and, and the management of it, and at least trying to understand it, you know, urine output came up quite often. What What's the role that urine output plays for you in car, in car, as a cardiac anesthesiology, anesthesiologist in the OR? Right. So, uh, again, that's unfortunate. We live in 21st century, right? And we don't have anything better than urine output as a monitor for kidney function, mm -hmm. period, you know. Uh, there, there is growing interest in biomarkers, still nothing better than uh, uh, just creatinine check. So the, the problem with biomarkers like creatinine, it raised 24 to 48 hours after the injury occurred, right? So the damage has already been done. Damage is already done. We know patients come in with normal kidney function. We can detect two days after the cardiac surgery Hell no, you can say when it happened. Did it happen before bypass with flu? Was it actually the bypass which is you know affecting the kidneys or our management, our drugs, vasopressors, which we give post bypass and in ICU? So uh, this is the current clinical challenges, and uh, that again leave us with uh, uh, the only options of urine output. And in a criteria to diagnose uh, kidney injury, it's not just raised in creatinine, 
which give you stages of AKI, but there is alternative one based on urine output. Mm. Uh, so what we do in a, in a cardiac surgery is eyeballing the, the foley uh, and just looking and urine how it's drip drop by drop by drop and you see that we're kind of happy we know the kidney is getting perfusion and they produce urine you don't see urine coming out urine bypass you start to worry and as you can see it's a, a, a more qualitative assessment mm -hmm. not quantitative assessment mm -hmm. and uh, you know that that's a problem mm -hmm. <laughs> and it sounds like you know the inability to monitor it not only accurately but continuously because right now you're having to eyeball it among the hundreds of other things that you have to look at you know in the in the ICU you know it is it ever an issue where you where you perhaps your output doesn't seem to be good but it might be that, let's say the catheter may be bent, or perhaps the patient is in a position where the bladder isn't draining draining very well. Is that is that a possibility? Well, uh, uh, absolutely. So the the problems with uh, eyeballing, there were several papers published about it, where they uh, uh, recorded what nursing ICU or anesthesia team in OR perceive as a urine output, right, and chart, and then they exactly measure it, right? Mm -hmm. And the error is as large as 30 to 40 percent. It's enormous, right? Mm -hmm. Think about this, somebody measure your heart rate or blood pressure and they put error 40 percent. It's a nonsense in 21st century. Why? Why has it existed for lo this this long? Why do you think? So uh, uh, there were several companies on the market from Europe, and I think one of the uh, Bard, uh, who basically tried to automate the process. Right? Basically, they will measure the urine uh, output minute by minute, uh, and 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 provide kind of taking this subjective. Uh, uh, nursing measurements away uh, and you know we had them at Hopkins we, we played with them you know we used them in the study and we were very happy and then um, uh, I don't know exactly but it was uh, the reason why it was withdrawn from the market uh, it, you know so some of the probably technical problems you know how accurately it measure you know how user friendly it is you know, if anything re required to uh, spend more time to set up equipment versus uh, charting, just just manually looking, it's a killer. Mm -hmm. So we still need real time, continuous, non-invasive or minimally invasive uh, monitor for kidney function, whether it's based on a urine output or something else, and it's critical that uh, it will be not cost prohibitive and it will be user friendly it will be integrated into electronic uh, health record and it's very important to be clinically validated now we want to be mindful of your times so we know you have to go soon but when you say user friendly this is definitely a big problem in across medicine which is very non-user friendly devices you know if you look at the critical care unit from 1970 and compared it to a picture now not much has changed the pictures I've seen the only thing that changes is that the bed moved in a different <laughs> different direction and so when you say user friendly what uh, what do you mean by that what specifically uh, uh, so uh, user friendly it meaning uh, it takes very uh, 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 minimal time on a uh, provider to set it up and it's automate as much as, as possible. Uh, I'll give you one example. Um, what is a great uh, uh, device right now on the market, uh, user-friendly, continuous, real-time, non-invasive. It's called pulse oximeter. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. It's a one sticker on the finger. You connect it before the surgery and you don't touch it, right? It's automatically on your monitor, non-stop. It automatically will go to electronic health record. That's it. And, you d and it doesn't alert your body unless something is wrong. Exactly. So same now with EKG. 
uh, I still remember when I was in medical school, you want to get a KG, it's a special bat, it's like almost like a, 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 a execution for you know electrical they strap your arms they strap your legs you know they they, they don't, don't breathe right <laughs> for whatever 12 seconds and somehow you'll <laughs> you're supposed to get an, a normal heart rate like if it's, like, if, it's a, a, if it's elevated <laughs> is it physiological or is it because of the chair right, <laughs> right. so now you put just uh, again stickers on on the patients away from the surgical field you connect it and you forget it right it's automatic something happens it gives you alarm you know, so this is kind of technology we need for different organ system. Brain, right? They come up with the idea of cerebral asymmetry, right? You know, whatever the sophisticated technology, it's extremely user friendly. Again, you put two stickers, non-invasive, no harm to the patient, no needle sticks, uh, and you're done. And it just use it through the whole case, right? So this is something uh, uh, it would be nice to use for kidney function. You put a couple of stickers, whatever it is, or, you know, fall it, and you forget it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to bend, you don't have to empty the foley, you don't have to remember, you know, is it one hour since I empty foley? Let's see what is the urine output now. Like, y y you hear my point, right? Mm -hmm. you, can, uh, you connect it at the beginning of the case and you forget. Mm -hmm. And it's automatic. I think this is really the future mm -hmm. of medical technology mm -hmm. for physicians because, you know, we uh, I sat in on a couple of the lectures with Dr. Uh, Dr. Perry at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Talked about the automation and intuition, and we had a discussion yesterday, and it, we we kind of agreed that the future is really to have technology that automates things that the physicians don't want to deal with, like you know, recording urine output every hour, and then once it's there. It's, it, you forget about it. You don't deal with it ever again. And so all these pieces of technologies are hooked up and out of the way so the physician can go back to bedside and spend more time directly interacting with the patient versus dealing with technology. I think a lot of, do you feel that a lot of physician burnout these days is because of having to deal with so much technology, inputting stuff into the MR and whatnot? Uh, so, so again, the electronic health record was a, was a big step. Right, mm -hmm. because uh, you know we used to paper chart, and it was even in United States leading institutions like ten years ago, right? So that's history, and we feel that difference where you're actually paying attention to the monitor and to the patient, not just charting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think same is coming uh, with monitoring technology, right? Uh, artificial intelligence, automatic alarms. There is clearly alarm fatigue, right? So you have to be very useful, you know, how you set them up, but this is where technology is going. You connect it, somebody on the background is constantly moving. If something going on wrong, you get the alarm, right? And it drives you all attention to mm -hmm. the patient, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that will be the future. Versus right now, it's a lot of it's it's too much. You're having to look at so many different data points and, you know, eyeball certain things. You right. Know. So again, if 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 I know what is a normal urine output and uh, my device will know it, I don't want even to know. Right. Same cerebral oximeter, same pulse oximeter. Right. I want it to alarm me only if something is wrong. If something is good. I shouldn't be focusing or do, you know refocusing my attention to the normal thing. Mm -hmm. I have to focus on what is important. All right, right. Well, Doctor, it was very, very enlightening and helpful. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome. That's what we do at Hopkins, you know, uh, bring new evidence and uh, spread the knowledge for the world. Absolutely, we appreciate it. Okay. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Hills and Valleys. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button on our podcast. That way you're notified of new episodes as they're released. And if you're not already, please go ahead and follow Potrero Medical on all our social platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And we'll see you next time.